Welcome to Design Lab. <laughs> We've been gone for a little while, but this is your virtual workshop series to provide Gladstone's community with ongoing training and support for a wide range of design and illustration uh, projects. We are your hosts. My name is Giovanni Mackey. I am the creative director here at, uh, for the comms department at Gladstone. And yeah. I'm Tammy Tolpa, and I'm the science illustrator at Gladstone. And um, yeah, we where have we been? We have uh, missed a couple of episodes. I got Some, COVID. Yeah, you got COVID. Yeah, that, that was the first goodness. one. <laughs> yeah, but you're healthy yep. now, so that's good. Yeah. And then um, I think the other one was bad timing. Oh, we had an on site meeting. So, right. Yeah. The comms retreat. So things just didn't work out, but here we are. So we're going to, but we're going to make that up for everyone, right? We're going to, what are we doing in the new year? We're going to double down. Yep. It sounds like two sessions in January. So two that we missed. So animation in PowerPoint and science posters. One. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that one because I'm trying out some stuff that's new for me as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely going to be. Um, it's, I'm I'm excited for it because I think there's some. Um, I think what you're working on and some other features are um, gonna uh, gonna be a lot of fun to play with. What are we doing? This what is this episode all about? We got some. This is the Q and A episode. <laughs> Yep. And and we got some we got some cues, right? Lot, yeah, lots of really good ones, some hard ones. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, lots of good ones. Some that we might use to inform a future session because uh, it was just too much. Yeah, it's a lot to cover. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so what are we starting out with first? What was our who who sent it in? What are we doing? Yeah, so um, Yulia, I hope I'm saying the name right, um, wanted to know what plugins are out there or what plugins that we use regularly. Uh, so that's where we're going to start. Yeah, and that is a really good question. Uh, so I did some digging because I think we do, we in the department do use plugins. Um, and in particular, we use a specific plugin, which is from uh, a product called the... Um, Astute, uh, Astute Graphics. Um, we will drop that. We should drop that link in there. This, um, yeah, and <laughs> we're real pros. So uh, Astute Graphics um, are uh, an amazing company that develops a very in-depth set of um, plugins for Illustrator. And I think um, they're probably well beyond the capacity of most people who are going to be using this um, for the sciences. I think it's like... Um, there are, it is extremely geared towards productivity. And I also think that it's like more for a professional illustrator and a lot of kind of creative or editorial illustrations. But we've, I, I mean, I found tons of uses for it um, to, to use on figure preparation. I'm gonna demo a couple of those now. But that is, I'll preface this with just saying that um, as I share my screen, that um, there, there are a scant few of, um, uh, of plugins. Actually, let me jump over to that. Let's just cover that real quick. So you can actually explore plugins for Illustrator. And I think if you are a CC subscriber, which I think most people here at Gladstone are, and it's how you acquire the software generally now, um, is that um, you go into your CC app. So open up your um, CC app and in there you can um, not under discover, uh, but you actually want to go to, so I gotta move windows around. Um, you actually want to go to the stock and marketplace. Um, and that's where people are sharing the availability of plugins here. And so you can browse all plugins and then you can sort of use your filter here to then filter in just the illustrator ones and see what's available. Now, what you find here is not what I would say even, I, I, I sort of scanned most of them and I didn't find a whole lot that really pertained to productivity for figure preparation. Um, you know, you have your Avery templates plugin. So those are getting directly from Avery. And so that might be handy for, uh, for the odd job or task, um, Pantone connect. Um, so that's a whole other kettle of fish and a little bit controversial because they really locked down. Now it's a paid for service. Um, but, uh, you rarely are going to be, I think delving into Pantone colors, but that is a, that is a professional need. A QR code maker, a barcode maker, you know, these are, these are funny little utilities that, um, that I think are probably, you know, um, uh, I think people could use, but um, I don't know. 
I, I, otherwise, I didn't find anything that was necessarily that applicable. I don't know. Did you find anything? Have you come across anything, Tammy? No. I mean, the astute ones kind of blew my mind when I first started working here. So yeah, those, so let's jump I back to looked, those. <laughs> I haven't looked any further than those, yeah. but they are, you yeah. do have to pay for them. And I think we figured out you have to get the whole set. You can't just get like one at a time, but I think I agree. There are some game changers, I think, for the kind of figures that investigators are putting together that come into Illustrator with a lot of stuff that needs cleanup. Yeah. And I say, yeah, that's, um, they, so if you're looking at my screen here, which you are, then you're seeing all of these little thumbnails, you know, all these little colored thumbnails. And that's actually the entire suite of, um, of, from the plugin. So there's a lot of tools and it's, um, I mean, it's real deep and it takes a long time. I mean, I haven't even explored all of them, but, um, uh, basically, uh, and I use, I use quite a few of them a lot. Um, but they're adding new ones all the time. That's what to say that there's, there's a lot of them down here, but this one in particular, this one with a little X on it with first aid, it's called vector first aid. And this one is in particular, like, so it's an invaluable tool for when you are trying to clean up and prep tool, um, prep, um, figures that, uh, you're trying to compile together. Now you're, you know, often I find is the case that you are exporting these out of other third-party applications and then bringing them then in, into illustrator. And, and in that case, then there's a lot of pollution and a lot of, or a lot of formatting that just kind of comes in a little bit weird and inconsistent across it. So, um, you need a quick way, or I need a quick way to be able to sort of get down to, you know, um, remove all the junk that might be in the application or in the file and just kind of clean it up quickly. And this is just the tool for that. So let me zoom out a tiny bit just so that way I can select this whole um, figure and I'm going to go in, back into here and I'm going to, um, it's got this check selection and it's, and it's checking it for errors. Um, and that gives me a readout of all the things that it found with it. And I can just hit the fix all, but basically, um, you know, it found 25 unneeded points, 21 redundant points, one duplicate art object and on and on and on. And it, and it just, a lot of this stuff is non-perceptive. Like you're not going to see any visible right. difference and it's not going to change any of it, but it's sort of, <laughs> I don't even know. Uh, oh, it's closing paths. Like all these things where otherwise you don't, um, you might run into these kind of issues or you might just, uh, you know, there's layering of junk on here that, um, that this is just kind of clearing away. So I'm going to go ahead and hit clear, um, fix all. And it's just going to go ahead and wipe that away. And I can just feel like I'm already starting off from a better place. Um, and if you can, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll run this a couple of times and it might find, um, other things, um, pop up. So I might run it twice and just, um, yep, it just found one more. So that was a little bonus. Okay, and that's so gonna get I, those weird clipping paths too, right? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. There, oftentimes you get like a like um, if it gets pumped or may, is pumped through Acrobat or is made PDF compatible, you will find that they are gonna it will generate a bunch of clipping masks because that's how if there's effects applied to another vector application or um, the way that it handled. Um, uh, particular styling is inconsistent. What it'll do is just, it'll wrap that thing in a, in a clipping mask and basically just, you know, stack those elements. So what you end up, what you end up with is all these multiple clipping masks that really are there for, um, for no reason. It's just an artifact of getting, um, becoming a PDF. Um, so yeah, it'll, that, this is a, that's a huge, um, benefit to that too. Um, so yeah, so otherwise when I take a look at this, um, this, so it doesn't really end there. There's more, there's more to it. If I select all these objects, um, basically, um, I can see here that there are some other things that are kind of going to get my way and I can take care of those here. And that's particularly the way that it's handling text and type. Um, so I can tell just visibly that some of the type is stretched out. I can tell that um, the anchor point for some of these objects is on and not where I want them ideally. Um, so these are all set to the left hand side, but these ones are actually center aligned. Um, all these ones along the Y axis or, or X axis are center aligned. And so is um, this label here, this label up here on the Y axis is also not center aligned where it, you know, the text is, but not the anchor point for that. And I'm talking about specifically, you know, this little point down here. And that comes in critical because if I go in to change this at all, um, then if I add any, you know, type after that, 
um, then that's then that's going to skew it off, and that's um, that's not really what I want. I want to be able to make this editable, um, so that way if I do ever have to augment anything or trim any, um, maybe I'm going to trim these brackets off. It's happening in, in um, uh, and maintaining its formatting. Um, so uh, the one thing that's kind of getting in my way of this actually is what I'm noticing is that this Moo character for this micrometer is actually outlined character. And that's also an artifact. If like, um, if that was a character that, you know, wasn't consistent with it or uh, not recognized as font, one way of handling it as a, as a PDF or, um, or, or in a conversion from another application is it's gonna outline that object. Um, so that way it doesn't have to recognize that or, or basically is if it didn't recognize that um that character in the character set or um so uh there is a new beta function in illustrator native to that now that um that will um actually figure out what the font is of that and be able to expand that but it is in beta and i tried it on this guy um but it says the selection is not recognized so mm. i might not be i might not be uh um, I might not be using this correct. Actually, look at this. There's some download here, but um, but <laughs> uh, instead of waiting for that because I, I didn't have any luck with that, um, what I do know is that Astute Graphics actually had this as a feature and for for many years now. Um, so Illustrator just added it as a baked in feature, but um, this is one that's been around in Astute, um, and um, that's pretty tried and true. So let's go back into vector first aid and you can see here that it's called the convert outline text to editable text. Um, and I'm just going to click this button and it'll go through my library, recognize what that font is or what that character is and place it in the, in the consistent font too. It'll recognize, it'll try to recognize what font that is and match it to it as well. Um, so I can go through all of these instances of the Moo and this plugin will convert that for me. And um, so now I've got these all together, but actually the problem is, is that this Moo one is, um, because I selected those all together, they all became one object. And I'm gonna go in here and I wanna break that up. So um, Astute has got my back there too. I can uh, break the selection of text apart into individual glyphs. So this is this little icon here. And I click, click on that button and there you go. Now they're all separate. Now, um, uh, now I'd like to, um, well, now I see that these are separate, but they're also separate. And I kind of, I want to be able to edit this as one individual one. And I could go through and I could, you know, um, copy and paste those back in or as like a, as a text object and, and they would, but you know, this jumbles together and, you know, there's no real easy way. It, it's a real laborious task to kind of come back through. I could. I could cut these and paste them back in or whatever, but, or I can retype them, um, but nobody likes doing that. And there's a lot of scenarios that are a lot more complicated than this. So um, so what I can do is I can go back into this uh, uh, vector first data and I can hit combine text objects and it'll do just that. It'll combine all of these. And um, that combined that entire row, but I actually want to have them individually. Um, so I can break, um, rather than the individual glyphs, this, this, um, there's a trio of icons down here. The center one is break selected text apart into words and mm -hmm. there now I finally get them into their individual words. So that was just with a, a few clicks. If I wasn't demoing this, that would have gone real quick. Um, I also noticed that there's, there's a slight artifact from this here where I can see there's, um, there's a, a kerning inconsistency and I can tell that because oops, let go away. I can see where that anchor point is in relation to the line on it. Um, this one appears to be the end, but I can see a tiny little gap there. Um, but essentially they're kind of inconsistent. So I'm going to go in there and I'm just going to hit, um, I'm going to set the kerning all to optical for all those guys. And now at this point I can go in here <laughs> and, um, and I can resolve the, the initial issue that I really wanted to resolve, which is I want to change the anchor point, um, to be centered. So that way, um, whenever I'm aligning things or whatever, or I'm adding text or augmenting these, it's always going to expand or contract on that center. If 
I tried to do that with a normal, um, with the normal character palette, or excuse me, paragraph pane, um, that uh, basically it would just realign it based on where that anchor is. But I don't want that. Um, I'd rather, I just want to move that anchor point as exists. And I can hit that. That feature is built in here. I can hit that and all of them realign to the center. So now as I edit these guys, um, they will edit to the middle. Okay, so that's um, especially great for situations like this too, where if I need to change these, then I can go in and now set this all to, rather than aligning left, I want them all to align, align right, just as they are, the, the, the objects themselves are aligned right. So now their origin point is also right. So if you were to add more zeros, right, it would move outward instead yes. of exactly on a, then, getting misaligned, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, or removing zeros or whatever you you know whatever you mm -hmm. might have to do. Yeah. So um, so now these are you know overall I think a lot of this stuff is um, getting more tightened up and a little bit more uh, sort of falling into best practices for the way that you're going to set this composition. Um, was there was there another thing I was going to demo for this? Before I jump into the uh, object on a, I can't remember. Was it just the scaling? Oh. Sometimes the text. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. It's yeah. Him. Yeah. Yeah. So um, reset the scaling. So um, uh, I think um, I think there was a script for this. That's why I'm pausing because I was like, wait a second. I think there is yeah, too. Yeah, I think there is. Yeah. Okay. I was confusing myself. Um, so there's two ways to go about this. I think one is that you can select, um, you can select all the text and um, go into the uh, the character dialog, and you can see here in the scaling. Um, I can tell here right away um, that this one is 100 percent and this one is 109.59. Um, and um, a quick way to kind of reset this is just to go back in here and basically set this back to mm -hmm. 100. Um, there is a rescaling one for text, uh, but let's maybe maybe I'll demo that in a second. So I won't even bother with that right now because um, we'll because that'll come up in, an, in a demo in just a bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so so that's vector first aid. That is just a, a component of this uh, of this suite of elements, and I think that we could probably spend an entire like five episodes of this going over. You know, I mean, five other ones because you could definitely dedicate a ton of time to each one. Um, we are not sponsored by Astute Graphics or anything like that. Uh, they have a ton of videos on how to use all of these. So I would definitely encourage anyone who wants to explore more of what these um, can do. I would um, suggest you kind of um, you'd explore those. I think this might come up again on a couple other demos and you might. Um, but but otherwise, I would say, you know, go to Astute, explore those out, um, you know, see if that pricing matches what you're willing to spend and um, and take a look. I think there's a seven really... day seven day trial too. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, and you should probably plan out those next seven days because you probably spend a lot of time on this before that kind of runs out. But that's pretty much it for um, plugins, right? I mean, we don't have a whole lot of suggestions about what is, um, you know, what's the best um, plugins to what other plugins might be really used for productivity. But uh, I, I think the un the the little known uh, feature of Illustrator is that there are also, in addition to plugins, there are scripts that you can download. Um, and those come in super handy. And I think um, few people use them. Uh, I, uh, um, they are a little bit of hand curation, a little bit inside baseball. I mean, you gotta, um, you gotta be a little bit of power use for Illustrator. Um, one caveat for it is that if there's any other major update to Illustrator, then um, then the scripts that you load will get stripped out and you have to reload them in. Um, so the, it, it does take a little bit of um, a little effort to be able to keep those maintained. Um, yeah, there's, uh, do we want to walk through uh, installing scripts? 
Or do we want to, uh, I think we're not going to have time. for. I think that that link you shared from LinkedIn actually did yeah. say pretty easily, like how to install them. Yeah. So, yeah. um, great point. But it was interesting that our t conversation about, um, plugins kind of really quickly turned to scripts because they're, you know, plugins, you, you know, the good ones you sort of have to buy. Um, yeah. but there were all these plugins that you were using and then that you found on that LinkedIn site that seemed to be like a nice transition to, well, it's, there's like cousins of, um, plugins. Right. And so, yeah, we sort of thought about, you know, talking about a couple of these, um, scripts and you had some really fun ones that um, I didn't know about. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, so one of those right here, I'll kind of demo, um, for this, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to like, um, oh, so we know that things are stretched out in this file. Uh, and one of those things is clearly also these data points. Um, that might not bother too many people, but I think um, it definitely bothers me and something that I would correct. Um, and uh, there is a great script for actually kind of correcting this sort of thing. Um, one, uh, so basically if I were, if I've, I think we've demoed this before on how we can, how you can correct those um, you know, with Illustrator, there's, uh, in Photoshop, really, there's like five different ways to do the same thing. Kind of depends on where you're at in your process. But, um, uh, I wanted to just demonstrate, um, one script that you could use that would help replace these elements. So rather than trying to get these to, um, basically square up or, or get perfect circles, um, one option is to actually just replace them all. And, um, there's a handy little script that can do that for you. So if I go in here and I'm just going to actually select and group this entire group and I'm going to um, double click into them so I can get into isolation mode, meaning that like I'm just handling and if I hit select all, I'm just dealing with this with this one figure rather than anything else. So I'm in isolation mode and I'm going to select um, this color blue dot. I'm going to handle those all first because that's what I'm I want to make sure that I'm preserving the 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 colors that are on um, uh, the that are um, keyed to obviously specific um, data points. Um, and I am going to hit the um, select similar objects and you can get that here in this um, icon up in your, um, up, your up in the um, tool tray or if you go to select and um, same uh, and I'm going to say in this instance, it's going to be um, fill color. Yeah. Okay, so it also got my key here, which I'm going to deselect with the lasso tool. Um, and uh, basically, I'm just going to delete those. Um, but I'm going to actually, you know what, how do I isolate? This is me thinking to myself, how do I isolate those ones? Yeah, let's get, let's just get those. I want these bars in particular. I'm going to group those guys so that way I can come back to them later. So now I'm going to go and select these guys so that way I don't forget them. And I really need to have the whole object selected before I can select them again. Again, I don't want to select my key. And at this point, I can see they're contained on just just those objects I want. I can delete them. And now um, I want to go and replace them. And if I select into there, um, then I, I also double clicked on the group that I had already made to make sure that I'm back in there and I'm working on the just the lines that I want to. And I'm going to make my new um, my new data point, and I'm going to um, use the eyedropper tool right here to then um, to get the style that is directly from the key. So I'm going to replace that again. And now at this point, I can go in here to this group. Um, I'm going to make sure to ungroup theirs. Let's go into my layers so that way you can see what's going on here. So now these are all ungrouped and in here. Now I have these all contained in a group and we're going to see what happens. But oftentimes a lot of these scripts don't work if things are grouped. Um, but this is this, this uh, blue dot is now the top object of all those other groups, um, which it needs to be. And then I'm going to go into my scripts and you can see here, here's, I've loaded a ton of scripts in here. There's a few that come, a poultry few that kind of come loaded pre with Illustrator. 
Um, but most of these you have to go and, and source and we'll provide some more links. I think we also have, um, uh, um, we'll, we'll provide a little bit of information because I think we found some dead links in there, even that LinkedIn one. Mm -hmm. But there's this, um, uh, let's see. There is a um, particular script in here called uh, dupe add selected anchors. And I'm going to go ahead and click that. And yes, of course, because it's grouped, <laughs> nothing happened. So I'm going to get mm -hmm. out of it. I'm going to go in here again. I'm going to ungroup that. I'm just going to ungroup everything so that way I can get it out. Oh no, I lost my. Okay, let's bring this guy. I don't want to lose the ones I'm keeping track of. So let's do this. This is also another little handy trick. I'm going to move these guys. I'm going to duplicate that. And I just I just um, drag that up and um, like option dragged. So hold the, I held down option as I drag that out. And it's um, it's not just moving it, it's duplicating it. And, I, and I'll show you why I'm doing this in just a second. But let's just duplicate this one and ungroup it. And then now I can uh, safely select all of them. They're ungrouped. And I'm going to say dupe at selected anchor. And there it is, finally. And now I have all those pointed in there. All those are all those are um, set directly on that data point of the that or that origin point of the data that um, that that line was, and now I can take this and um, basically replace it back with my. Uh, let's see where did it go. It's here, so I can replace it there. Um, and I can do that across, um, I can keep that sort of section group and call that my good set. And as I go through there, I could kind of replace those and use this, use those background elements as just like basically my my reminder of the exact location it was, but I could go back through and, and reset those. Um, you know, this isn't necessarily the most ideal scenario to actually do all that, but you can imagine like there's, there's a myriad of different ways, which um, maybe you just want to replace all of them um, with just dots, um, you know, you probably, there are probably are many scenarios too, where the, like, um, the lines will also color key to it. So you don't have to do as much management as I was just doing, but either way, this is a way to definitely get back and, um, and reclaim some of that sort of misformatted elements with a handy little script. Yep. All right. So where are we, was there another, where are we with our questions or what was the so we there was a script demo you were going to do to create a cell population. Um, but we also have Emily here, and she came to us with a bunch of questions. So I don't know if we want to yeah. make oh, sure yeah. we talk about hers. So she had a bunch of exports from R that she was formatting in Illustrator. And she had those three um, particular questions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I pulled up, um, uh, we stripped out some information, but I pulled up your um, your uh, figures in particular, and I think uh, what you had shared with us, and 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 I think we contacted you again because what I found here was um, was basically that the information is not vector; it is actually raster information. So, however, it was exported is now um, raster information or pixels rather than vector shapes that are filled, um, except for the gradient um, that denotes the um, the, uh, the spectrum of colors that is actually natively vector. So I can show you how to alter the um, the colors or the best way that I know possible in Illustrator, um, but it's not going to be able to alter the the raster image. And there are tons of ways to, for you to convert those and to capture those. Um, but uh, nothing would be more simpler than just re-exporting that from R or from whatever graphing application or data applica application they're using that would that would um, retain that vector information. Um, the problem is is that you know once it's rasterized, um, then depending on the resolution, they'll always be or they very well could be like um, two color pixels landing in between. And the inference of those would be like um, like a very small, you know, bit of, uh, uh, I'm not seeing any here, so that's not a great example of it. But this is, um, uh, what you don't want to do is introduce any errors. Basically, what Tammy, you and I were talking about is like, uh, I wouldn't want to touch it. I wouldn't want to convert this 
because you just don't want to change or like um get any um get any random uh you know randomization in there you want to keep it consistent i mean yeah, i guess so, an example oh i was just say just for context emily was wanting to know if she could shift all the colors in that heat map and in that spectrum and still um retain the accuracy and emily you could come off mic if you want um that PDF you sent me when we opened it, it was still a raster for the heat map. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's okay. So we, we, yeah, so we still weren't able to, um, to edit it as, you know, vector art, but still, mm -hmm. I think still the answer is it made us nervous, right. To sort of yeah. think about those kind of color changes on, in your data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the short answer really was that Illustrator is a vector or a drawing application. Photoshop is a painting or a pixel or raster image application. And like, basically there we're, we're not at a, um, thankfully, uh, you know, Adobe and most of these are not trying to combine functionality of, of those two worlds. Um, they are really kind of separate and get handled separately. So the, the short answer is just do it in Photoshop, um, or just do it in illustrator. Um, but if you have, um, if you're trying to convert one to the other, um, then, then it's not really possible and it's not really possible to, because these are raster images. And I think that's a, a common thing that kind of happens. And that was part of your, I think the second part yeah. or, or second mm -hmm. question really is that how do you do this in illustrator if it is already rasterized? And the answer is just don't even try. It's not, I, I wouldn't, um, um, I think we had. I think um, here here was an example of one of these um, that that you could handle in Illustrator, and the 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 solution would essentially be just make your dots like basically just cover this with a new little dot, um, and you uh, could okay. kind of do that. <laughs> yeah, you could do that with this one, right? That wouldn't be that hard because I think there's a grand total of like ten, um, but yeah, you wouldn't want to try that on something right. like this. Yeah, um, that would get chaotic kind of fast. <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, the solution is basically just open this in Photoshop. Um, and there you can use a color picker and isolate those colors individually. And from that point, then you can alter the um, the colors um, really easily. And then you can relink that in here. Um, you know, we were talking about Astute and its capabilities. Um, one of those is um, be able to alter real fluidly between Photoshop and Illustrator raster images that are already embedded, which this one is. Um, so, you know, basically, um, basically all that's doing though is opening a temp file um, that that you don't have to save um, to your hard drive somewhere and relink. It automatically handles all the linking and the updating, um, but. But yeah, you're having to jump over to that Photoshop file to be able to do that. Okay. And let me just demo real quick though about what happens or what the solution is. If if this were all vector as this um, as this spectrum is, um, mm -hmm. so basically here the only the only real option to be able to maintain the relationships between the colors because you have this gradation where basically one color is is um, transitioning to another one. And those specific color or hues in between those are are also very, you know, they're important to maintain, obviously. Um, th the only way you can do that is basically shifting the entire spectrum all, um, all together. So if I go into my um, recolor artwork tool, again, you have this icon up here for this recolor artwork. Um, and I click on this and, and I, I'm looking at my dialogue here. You can see that, right? The dialogue? Yep. Okay, yep. great. Um, and then um, I can look in here and it, it pops up in this assign um, tab. But if I look in the other one, this edit tab, um, yeah, if I switch it over here to this uh, display, display smooth color wheel, then each one of these nodes is basically representing a different color here that is, that is shown <laughs> on these. Um, you know, you can you can change the different view, but they're basically showing the same information. But this one kind of helps you see that if I um, this is the important part, we have to make sure that the um, the harmony colors are linked. Um, so I want to make sure that is set to link and then I can start to shift the colors here. But um, they're oh. not the most pleasing sort of combinations, <laughs> but you might find one there, I guess. Um, and that's that's really uh, 
it's uh, what I think we, Tammy and I both realize, that's not a real ideal scenario. Um, what I think you want to do is like determine what are each one of the colors and then have that blend shift as well. But there's no, um, uh, there's no real way that I've figured out to be able to do that without really compromising, um, you know, uh, the, the relationships, like, cause you would have mm -hmm. to hand curate each one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's cool though to know. Thank you. I appreciate so, it. So Emily, was it, I understanding right that like you couldn't control the colors from R, it kind of was just picking these red and blue and yellow. Yeah, for most of the packages that I use, like you're able to put in specific palettes, but this mm -hmm. one in particular um, is is putting out these either rasterized plots or just like defaulting to one specific color scheme. I'll have to play with the export on that a little bit. Um, but that one on the R side of things, I haven't figured out how to um, how to change the colors. It seems like it's hard more hard coded in the package. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I was curious if there was another way to make it match some of the ones that I've made in other packages. But it sounds like it might be more of an R troubleshooting than an Illustrator troubleshooting question. Yeah, unfortunately, I kind of think so. And I, I mean, I would feel safer doing it that way. Um, but this is something yeah. that I've. I've definitely come across this um, a couple of times and and thought on this, and I feel like there might be a solution. I don't know if uh, anybody watching would include that in the comments on YouTube or something like that. But that I I'd be curious to know. I it's um, but I for one of I can't think of a solution that would that would be able to maintain all those color those relationships to each other and change those nodes. Yeah, I think even if that heat map were a vector, or you know, if we did it. A quick and dirty you know trace it or something it still kind of made us nervous to go in there and play around with those colors and make sure you had the same you know yeah. you were accurate to your data mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so sorry to disappoint that's all we got <laughs> <laughs> that's okay it's but, good to know it saves me time trying to figure out if it exists <laughs> yeah yeah but you had that third question too about the grid right sort of um linked or embedded artwork on a grid. Yeah, but yeah. I think like just for the align tool, like is there a way to align a grid of images without doing like each row and each column individually? Yeah, yeah. and I think Tammy, we both had some good solutions for that. But I think um yeah, why don't you why don't you walk through what your solution was first? Sure, yeah. So we had a couple as I mean one of the nice things about um working with other people or even sort of doing this kind of thing is you realize, oops, I need to share a different way. Um, is that you realize like there's, there isn't um, just one way to do things, right? And so I probably would do what you had described, which was um, align, you know, your columns and rows. But in the spirit of talking about scripts and plugins today, I decided I would try. Um, I found a plugin that would sort of do this with some limitations. So I can run through that real quickly. Um, over here, I just want to point out, I've got my layers palette. So I've got a uh, like a reference grid here. And then I sort of made like a messed up one here. I'm just going to lock that layer so I don't touch it. So um, I don't know, you know, these could be wildly spread out and this script would still seem to work, but you probably have something that's a little bit closer like this. So um, the way that works, and this is new for me, um, is that you select all of them and then you go to file scripts. And then this one was called, um, distribute stacked objects. So when I select that, how many, how much, I don't know what it's, this padding is pixels or I don't know what it is, but I'm just going to pick a number. Did you have a guess, Giovanni? I was going to, I would guess that it might be set on the increments or the units that you have for your document. So like if you if you went oh. into your ruler and you said and you depending on if you have that in inches or points or what it might you know centimeters okay. then it might it might just reflect that but that's just a guess. It looks like I might have it set to inches, so we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you pick a number and then you here's where you can pick: is it horizontal, vertical, or grid? So I'm going to pick grid, and then I'm going to say okay, and so then it did it did snap them into a grid. But if I look right. over at this reference one, it they're not accurate. Like it's it switched them around. Um, That's not great. <laughs> right. So let me undo. Um, 
Oh, yes. Let me just show you what I wanted to show you. Um, if you go into this layer stack here, so it it creates a grid based on where the place art is in the stack. And so this is different than the layers palette. And I didn't learn this until I was a couple years into working in Illustrator. So you have your different layers, but then each layer, it sort of has its own layers. And so um, it creates this grid based on this layer stack. And so if I want it to match this one, I have to go in and make sure um, my layer stack is accurate. So luckily these elements were named with like zero hour, one hour, six hours. So I can just rearrange the stack here. And so um, really quickly, it looks like the top row was the green ones. And then we've got like, oops, what, we've got the teal. We need to go zero, one, six, zero, one, six, zero, yeah. one, six. Okay. You know, that's pretty easily managed though. That's like not a, that's not a lot to ask for using that. <laughs> and then I'm going to read. Oh yeah, go um, ahead. Once you organize that, I mean, then yeah, it's just a one or two clicks and then it, it's done all the work for you. So that's really, it's actually pretty damn convenient. Yeah. So now that I redid that script, um, it looks like how I want it to look. So it's just that what I discovered when playing around this, the caveat is a, it's pulling from the stack. So you want to make sure your, it's, you want to make sure your elements are accurate here. Um, I didn't see any place to control the number of rows or columns. So it just happened to work out that we had enough um, here that it, that it made a nice three by three, but you'll notice there wasn't any place in there to say, I want four rows by three columns or something like that. So I think it's utility is a bit limited, but it did exactly what we wanted to do here. And like I said, even if these were like wildly, you know, scattered, it would still do the same thing. So, you know, that's pretty cool. I don't know if that sort of, well, let's try 10 and see what that was. Yeah, so that's not 10 inches. It must be pixels must be or something. Points. Yeah, pixels. Yeah. Um, so Emily, I don't know if that if that will be helpful to you, um, but that is one solution to your to your grid um, conundrum. And you know, you can play around with the spacing. Let's just see really quickly what it does if I do um like the rows. Where was that? Scripts. So 10. Let's say I just wanted. A vertical column. So then, you know, it spread them out that way. So, one possible way to sort of clean up a bunch of place microscopy or whatever into your um, into your file. But I know you also mentioned that sometimes they're slightly different sizes, and so um, that's where we have another idea for you. So yeah, so I'm going to stop sharing, and Giovanni's going to show um, a different way to sort of handle that. Uh, one way of resolving the fact that the images that you import might be slightly different size. So they might, you know, might be 300 by 306 pixels and the next one's 300 by 300 perfectly square. And, you know, they all kind of vary quite a bit. You could, you could basically make sure that the crop is perfect in say Photoshop or wherever you're, wherever you initially curated those images. But um, oftentimes the case that basically you don't get to, um, or that's like an extra step. So there is a way to handle, um, cropping and making a consistent window in illustrator. And that way is generally by using the, the clipping mast function. Okay. So, um, except these are all pretty, they're perfect, perfect. <laughs> right? They're, they're all perfect. Yeah. They're the same size. Um, but let me change that real fast. Let me just crop these. Also, um, this crop tool um, is destructive. I don't recommend using the crop tool in in Illustrator because it tends to be, um, uh, like I said, it's just a, uh, um, it's destructive. So it'll it'll uh, change the the file completely, and um, it doesn't allow for a lot of micro adjustments, which um, which I think is what the clipping mask kind of allows for. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, let's just do, I'll just do a couple more real fast just to get that variety. Just do another row. And okay, and we'll leave this one perfect as is. So um, the idea is that, um, yeah, if you wanted to, if you're starting out, um, I think what Tammy, what you just showed basically is a great way to like clean up a file that is, um, that you already have all the assets in. 
Um, but the way that um, that I might be working is that I would just want to establish the grid, and then I want to start importing my image in that images in there. And I think um, uh, one way to go about it, because of course we could always do the method that you sort of described, which is um, you know just getting um, getting a series of objects, and you know just uh, I, I just did an option drag on that just to duplicate it out. And then another little thing is to hit Command D, and that's going to replicate your last uh, move. And then I would just basically drag out another set. Oops, I want to get all this whole group. I'm going to drag out another one with another option drag and then replicate that. And I get my grid and then I can start populating it. Right. Um, but I think uh, there's another way that's a little bit more flexible, or maybe you're still in the process of like figuring out your layout. And that is just by um, using the transform effect tool, which I think is also another sort of underutilized function and super powerful. So if I just select the one object and I go in here to my effects panel and um, under distort and transform is transform. And this is just like, um, just like the transform uh, function that you can do on an individual object. Let me cancel out of that and show you where that is. If I, if I context click on an object Excel itself, um, I can, I can go into um, transform here and I can say transform each. And this will bring up a dialog that is identical to the transform effect one, except for it doesn't have um, how many copies you're going to do. You'll see that in a second. Um, but essentially, I can, you know, with this dialog, I can change the appearance. Random is selected for an unknown reason. So I can I can select the horizontal width and the vertical width, and I can augment like a I can transform the object essentially. Okay, so this is um, standard how you do it here, but actually um, if you use the effect version of this, then it gets um, starts to get a lot more powerful. Um, so as I said, there's this additional element here called copies, and um, I'm gonna make two additional copies because what I'll, I'll replicate this three by three grid, um, and then I'm gonna move that horizontally. And when I move it horizontally, rather than the original object moving, it's actually the copies that are moving. Um, and I can specify the exact distance I want here. Again, I'll put in 17 points or, um, oh, actually, that's not gonna. Um, so it's to the point of origin. So I've got to, um, I've got it in inches right now. So I'll keep it like that, 0.75, that's good enough. Um, so um, I hit okay, and that's got my first row, but it doesn't have my other, um, it doesn't have my, um, uh, the, the rest of the columns. So in order to do that, there's a couple options, and one is um, one is to actually group that element. I can't um, I, um, with with the transform. If I just um, if I went in to edit that, you know, it's just applying that that one effect to it that's moving it over. But if I group this element, then I know that I can apply another effect on a group, and it'll and it'll affect it independent from that from that first one. So I hit group. I'm now selected on the group rather than the individual object in it. You can see that in my layers panel here. Um, and then if I apply that effect again to that, um, then instead of going horizontally, I will also add two copies and I will go vertically and move it the same amount, 0.75. And so I've made that. Um, but um, there's actually a slightly better way. And um, also, it highlights an important feature in Illustrator, which I think also is a little underutilized, which is that you can have multiple instances of an effect or an appearance element on a single object. So I'm going to back that up, ungroup that, and I now have these this one object selected. And I'm going to look in the appearance pane. I'm trying to move this down. There we go. Look at my appearance pane, and I see this transform right here. So this is the I'm going to toggle that on and off. And I can see that here, and I'm going to actually just um, click on it with holding down Option to duplicate it. And you can see that little plus symbol is there. And I'm just going to place it above, and you can see that it it in fact duplicated another instance of that. Um, but it's not doing what I want. I'm going to I'm going to click back into that again um, to that now reset this to zero. Um, and I, I want this to go vertical. So here I go, 0.75. 
And now from that one object, I've kind of set that grid and created a grid for myself. And that's my template. And now at this point, um, you know, I can use this for setting layout. So that way I can sort of figure out, you know, what my composition is going to be even before I start populating with images. But as soon as I'm ready to do that, um, what I would do is I would expand this guy out. Um, and then um, now I'm coming back to how do I, how do I make all these, you know, weird shaped um, ones look consistent? Well, I'm going to use these all um, as clipping masks. So these are all my frames that I want. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my image over that I want and I'll try to keep these in the right sequence. Um, so I click on my frame and I click on my image and I have them, I have the image behind the frame that I want. And I'm going to say, create clipping mask object. Uh, where is this? I know it's command seven, but help me out here. Where down, down more clipping mask. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Make. Yeah. Clipping mask, make, um, Oh, it's telling me things are in groups. So I'm going to ungroup, ungroup. I'm going to do the same thing for my, for my set of uh, grid. So I'm going to reselect those both and I'm going to hit command seven or go up to object clipping mask make. So there I have my perfect square lined up on that and I can just go through and do that with the rest of them. And um, this is a good example because this one's falling outside. When I make this one, I can select with my, not with my objects or with my, uh, yeah, object select tool, but with the direct select tool, I can select just the image. So that's the white arrow. And I'm going to go ahead and align that with the top corner. And then, um, then I can switch or toggle to my object select tool. So that way I get these, um, these nodes on here where I can expand it out and I can, um, then scale it to the size, which it fills, um, and hopefully find that location on it that you want. This is obviously just an example of, of how the clipping mask work. You're not going to want to rescale your microscopy, but, um, but if the microscopy is coming in, you basically are finding a square that fits that lowest common denominator for height and width where they're all going to fit into. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, I keep on going down the line. And doing the same thing for all these command seven to get that clipping mass working, start aligning it up, switch over to object or to transform tool. So that way I can scale it up and then find all that, find that, um, happy spot where they're all going to be consistent. So it might seem like a bit tedious, I would say, mm -hmm. but I think if, but I don't think it is. I think once you make this kind of grid as a template and then you get yeah. into the rhythm of like using the clipping masks, I think it could be highly reusable. And so, I mean, we can think of like a quicker shortcut, right. To sort of get to this other than kind of these ideas or what you already know, which would be align your rows and columns and right. But then right. you're, but then you're always having to then cons be concerned with if you, if, if you had, um, if you had a series of, of images that have inconsistent formatting or aspect ratio, you would right. still have to figure out what, right. you know, how would you do that anyway? So, you, you know, ultimately you would have to, um, resize them or make them consistent in some way, but that's why I really like this solution that is, um, uh, basically if you set your frames, then mm -hmm. you can make those images fit the frame and, yeah. uh, and you're not fussing around with like, oh, okay, you know, I have to make this one exactly this tall, you know, it's all very optical. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's it, Timmy. All right. We'll very close good. This one out. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for everyone. And, uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.